Historically, the attempt to develop ethics for animals has focused overwhelmingly on pleasure and pain. And it was largely a British phenomenon working in the so-called utilitarian tradition, including Bentham, Mill, Sidgwick, Saul, and Peter Singer, that the basis for ethics is the fact that all organisms seek to uh, avoid pain and um, experience pleasure. And that seemed to them to be an observable and obvious basis for ethics that lends it, lends itself well to quantification. Um, and in this way, at least in Britain, and to a secondary degree in America, people were able to escape from uh, the European Cartesian skepticism that denied animals any moral status because uh, it denied that animals had consciousness. As we all know probably from basic philosophy, Descartes said that animals were machines. Hume has a great swipe at Descartes where he says the fact that obvious that animals feel uh, pleasure and pain is so obvious to common sense that it escapes only the most stupid, <laughs> meaning the French. Uh, got that right. An adequate account of animal ethics must transcend the exclusive concern with pleasure and pain, though the pleasure and pain view is simple and attractive. I think that an adequate morality towards animals must recognize the full range of possible, what I call matter, things that matter, that are unique to different sorts of animals. And of course, that's the basis of our ethic for people. We worry about the many ways our actions can affect people. So to accomplish this, it's good to look to Aristotle, the greatest common sense philosopher of the ancient world, specifically to his concept of telos, P-E-L-O-S, or animal nature, which was a root notion of its functional teleological biology. Modern biology, as you all know, being biologists, focus on reductionism, molecular, mechanistic explanations. Aristotle's biology, in contradistinction, emphasizes the unique set of traits and powers that make the animal what it is, the pigness of the pig, the dogness of the dog. Aristotle recognized that different animals evidence different ways of fulfilling the fundamental nature of living things, namely nutrition, locomotion, sensation, cognition, and reproduction. Biology studies these functions in different sorts of animals, and it's the complete set of these functions that constitutes an animal's nature, or telos. In fact, high school biology is still studied in this Aristotelian way. There is absolutely nothing mystical or mysterious about telos. It is simply what common sense recognizes as fish got to swim, birds got to fly. The only departure that must be made from Aristotle today is to see animal telos not as fixed and immutable, but as slices of snapshots of the dynamic process of evolution, genetically encoded and environmentally expressed. So I believe that an adequate morality towards animals should address not only pleasure and pain, but the full range of possible matterings following from animal nature. And you can uh, think along with me and test this against your own intuitions. When we evaluate, for example, gestation craves for sows, we must compare them to what a sow does under natural conditions, where she actualizes her telos, the kind of conditions she was evolved for. She will, it is known, based on work that uh, some British ethologists did, she will cover a mile a day brooding uh, and foraging, nest building, all of which behaviors are absolutely impossible to perform in a crate. In fact, given the telos template, it is evident that we regularly violate fundamental interests of animals as determined by their biological natures. We prevent their moving, we stop them from eating what they, are, what they are naturally built to consume by not letting them graze, hunt, or forage. We lessen their ability to cope with weather change, climate change. 
we do not allow them to exercise. Denying these natural activities harms the animal in many ways, impeding their exercise of the very powers they have evolved in order to survive. I was very amused uh, a few weeks ago when one of the uh, PR people for the swine better there has made an extraordinary statement about gestation crates. Did you guys read it? He, he said uh, to the public, how do you know when sows want to turn around? Do they talk to you? Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And uh, in fact, he ended up having to uh, apologize for that moronic statement. Uh, it's extremely obvious to any farmer and any ethologist what pig nature is. It's not that complicated. And in fact, animal nature is a lot easier to understand than human nature. Um, human nature is, of course, the basis for the Bill of Rights. If you want to know what uh, the founding fathers thought of as essential to being a human being, you look at the Bill of Rights. A non-obvious example of violating animal nature may be found in a music story related to me by Al Markowitz, uh, ethologist in California. He recounts that the Portland Oregon Zoo built a showpiece exhibit for servals. You know what servals are? Not graduate students. Uh, it's a different kind of serval. Uh, serval is a is a S E R V A L. It's a South African bobcat roughly about the same size as a bobcat. Um, and so they, they built this exhibit even importing sand and plants from the Kalahari Desert. The exhibit was a dud. The circles lay around in obvious depression, even refusing to eat. Markowitz visited their native habitat, stayed there for three weeks, and found that the bulk of these animals' time was spent predating low-flying birds, their main source of food. I've seen videos of it there, these little scrub brushes, bushes, and the little cats get down in the bushes and wait for a bird to fly fairly near, leap up in the air and pull them out of the air, and thereby eat. Um, so Markowitz told the zoo that they were not accommodating the animal's nature of uh, feeding. And so the zookeeper said, what are we supposed to do to turn loose the canaries? and let it pull them out of the air, that was not going to work. Um, what he said was, instead of feeding horse meat in chunks, the keeper should grind the rations into meatballs, which were then to be shot randomly across the exhibit enclosure by a compressed air tank. Uh, you got a mental picture of this? Uh, it, it was, the computer was programmed to, to shoot the meatballs at random intervals. Um, the animal's behavior changed overnight. They became excited and active, clearly exercising the pervading aspect of their feelings. Despite the power of the food drive, which is undeniably one of the most important drives a uh, living being has, it was trumped here by the failure of the zoo to accommodate how they had evolved to eat. Similar strategies provide for telos accommodation for many animals in captivity. Are any of you lab animal vets? If you're a lab animal vet, you know that one simple form of enrichment for primates, not human primates, is to sprinkle the food into the litter on which they live. And then the monkeys will spend, in a very naturalistic way, a lot of time picking through and removing the food items from the, from the other animals. An example for Pretty bush league. <laughs> <laughs> this better? An example from coyote behavior strikingly illustrates how telos needs can even trump physical pain. This is a very important point, more important than physical pain. It has been recounted for years that coyotes caught in a leg hole trap will chew their legs off 
enduring terrible pains rather than submit to immobility. And I checked this with the wildlife department in Colorado on this. It's documented fairly regularly. And this is true for other animals such as raccoons. This is, of course, understandable given the kindness of telos as a free ranging predator or just as much on some occasions prey. It is not plausible to suggest that the animal chooses its leg off to avoid death, since it is not possible that a non linguistic being has a concept of death, though it clearly understands the inability to escape. Obviously, the animal is not chewing the leg in order to escape the pain, as any attempt to chew the leg off will greatly increase the pain. So you have to really conclude from that that chewing the leg off means that immobility is more important to the coyote than pain. Fair enough? Other animals, while the domestic, will endure pain and injury to escape close confinement. Though you often find the confinement agriculturalists in the United States claiming that all needs are confined sounds, for example, food, water, protection from the elements, protection from predators, are meant to find this. In fact, these animals escape whenever they can, with no report that ever been in confinement of the heavy front of the return. It's sort of like how uh, East Germans would cross the wall to get into West Germany. There was no record of any West Germans getting over the wall to get into East Germany. Chickens will trade ad libitum feeding and confinement for sporadic access to food outdoors. Chickens will also, and chickens are not medical giants, will also work for food and confinement when given a choice of doing so rather than just eating at liver. Monkeys and other animals will self-mutilate the deprived of potters environments. The theory is that the pain provides some stimulation as a county board. Ron Kilgore, a uh, pioneer in New Zealand farm anthropologist, cites evidence showing that cattle being exposed to a new herd show a physiological response for 30 days. In animals, the initial exposure to the experimental setting, that is to say, a major novelty, evokes the largest elevation of plasma cortisol of any other stimulus. This is not surprising, since cattle are herd animals who come to know their conscious as individuals, and hence do not know how new animals will behave. Novelty of any sort evokes stress in most of the animal animal kilo. In researching this paper, I found something truly incredible, namely that the introduction to the experimental situation for human subjects used in research for the first time was consistently more effective than elevated steroid levels than anything else the experimenters could devise, including electric shocks. Novelty is a stressor. Researchers know that animals can be trained by reward to willingly accept some physically painful experimental procedures. There was, for example, a colony of baboons in Australia in the 70s where they were free ranging and the researcher. Bernie. Oh, sorry. Uh, they were free ranging and the researcher could uh, blow a whistle and they would come, get a blood draw, and then get a tree. All right? This was in significant contrast to uh, the way the same baboons were kept in, uh, in Davis at the primate center. I was appalled in the early 80s to see that they were individually housed in three foot by three foot by three foot boxes, cages. Uh, baboons, of course, are social and uh, cover a fair amount of ground in the day. They could not cover no ground. And uh, I remember the director of the primary center, I asked him, why do you keep them that way? And he said, because they're mean. And I said, did it ever occur to you that they're mean because you keep them that way? All right, I haven't seen the Australian ones. In one instance, one of my friends, a veterinarian, was drawing blood from dogs daily for a vaccine study. 
She would enter the facility, play with each dog, draw the blood, and then give the dog a treat after the draw. On one occasion, one of the dogs set up such a howl as she was leaving that she thought she got this paw caught in the door. You know that particular howl? Ay, 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 ay. Um, it turned out, in fact, that she had forgotten to draw blood from there. <laughs> and that he had missed his play in this tree, which obviously bothered him more than the blood drawing. Um, and there have been a lot of researchers who were very clever about this. Rather than trying to fight with the animals, use their natural behavior as a way of getting them to comply with some experimental protocol. Separation of a newborn calf can cause mooing on the part of the mother cow be speaking distress for over a week, far longer than that if the cow can consider to see the calf. This is no surprise, as calves in more natural situations will suckle and remain with the mother for up to nine months or more. You can see that in beef cattle on range. All of these examples illustrate three major points. One, pain as a physical phenomenon does not even begin to capture all the ways that what we do to animals matter to them. Two, other things we do to animals can be worse for them than physical pain. Unfortunately, we have no words, and this reflects the culture. We don't care, largely. But we have no words for many of the myriad ways we can harm or cause animals to suffer. For example, not allowing the pig to forage, separating a newborn animal baby from its mother at birth, stopping the chicken from nest building, etc. For some of these states of affairs, we do have words. Creating boredom, social deprivation, fear. And three, in general, interfering with or impeding actualization of telos creates a negative experiential state for an animal. Further, there is no simple word to express the many ways we can hurt animals besides creating physical pain. The ways are as countless as the multiplicity of telos and the interests that flow from them. So to express this, I use a, a pretty barbaric phrase called negative matter. Negative mattering means all actions or events that harm animals or create misery, such as the right thing, removing its young unnaturally early, keeping it so it's unable to socialize, maternal deprivation, social separation that not only causes distress, but also leads to physical illness and causing grief. Are you all familiar with the, with the work of Harry Harlow? Any of you? Harlow is a Wisconsin psychologist who once remarked that 95% of research is not worth doing. Well, he should talk. What he did, he was the guy who took baby monkeys away from their mothers and gave them a mother's, and surrogate mothers made of barbed wire or um, cloth or electroshock, actually. And Harlow discovered, Mirabili Dictum, miraculous to say, that if you do that to little monkeys, they grow up neurotic. And this is a lifetime career. And in fact, the students did endless variations on this to this day. One guy, for example, who's a friend of mine, worked on uh, raising baby monkeys in total sensory deprivation conditions. And guess what? They grew up neurotic too. Um, and you know John Gluck at New Mexico? He was a student of Harlow. And he's been a friend of mine for 25 years, but I never knew this until I heard from one of his caretakers. He felt so guilty for having built a career on doing Harlow type stuff to the monkeys that one day he just quit cold, absolutely quit doing it, would not turn into any of his research than anybody else, and has kept the animals alive at his own expense, doing nothing to them for the ensuing 25 years, and will do so as long as it takes. It's costing him a fortune, but he feels it's the least he can do to atone for this kind of uh, stupid research. Physical pain is perhaps the paradigm case of negative matter. 
but only to constitute a small part of what the concept covers. Together with negative matter, I believe very strongly, and I believe uh, I virtually bet on in any of these, that society is going to move in the direction of demanding not only control of negative matter, but actually creating conditions of positive matter. For the animals. This would encompass all states that are positive for the animals. Freedom of movement, pleasure, a sense of security, play, uh, all the way up to a fairly esoteric thing among pigs that young boars have to be exposed to older boars in what the behavior is called allomimesis so that they can learn reproductive behavior from the older boars. And without that sort of uh, an exposure, it's extremely difficult to get them to engage in reproductive behavior despite the, the incredible power of the sex urge. If this, is, if this analysis is correct, it is morally obligatory to expand the scope of veterinary medicine and animal welfare science to study all the ways things can matter negatively to animals as well as positively matter as society grows ever more concerned about animal treatment. And in other talks, I will spend a half hour tracing the degree to which animal welfare has become a major societal concern in the last 40, 50 years from nothing. Just to give you one example, um, before, let's say before 1970 or 1980, how many laws were there in the United States pertaining to the treatment of animals? Two. It's a very simple question, because basically all that existed were the cruelty laws, the state cruelty laws, and then there was some um, law. There was a law about the movement of agricultural animals, and, uh, getting them off the truck after a certain amount of time, and feeding them uh, food and water. So forth. Um, can you guys guess? In 2004, there were a lot of laws proposed all over the United States on the state, local, and federal level. How many? Lots. Remember, we're starting from the baseline of, of maybe two, three laws at most. 50 states, how many laws? 250. One or two per state? <laughs> yeah. So 100. That's a good guess. Hmm? 32,000? No. No. 2,400, which I find remarkable, going from a baseline of nothing. 2,400 bills proposed dealing with everything you could think of in relation to animals, <clears throat> including things like zoos and rodeos and so forth and so on. That's quite a contrast from 1970. In 1970, when I came to Colorado, there were only the cruelty laws. And I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about the cruelty laws because they're extremely impoverished. Uh, I don't know if the gentleman said that. Did he? Lawyer? Prosecutor? Not really. Did he tell you they were very weak? Well, I'll tell you that. I'm sorry he's done. Um, you got to talk into the mic. <laughs> um, so, it is necessary to understand which forms of negative mattering are most problematic from an animal's perspective. Obviously, the challenge is to study these without hurting the animals, which is a non-trivial challenge. So using telos as the core concept in animal ethics rather than pleasure and pain has numerous advantages. It helps us to understand our obligation to animals in higher resolution. It stops us from classifying insults as diverse as a blow, sickness, grief, loneliness, boredom on a continuum of only one axis, i.e. pain. And the same holds, of course, for uh, various states of pleasure. 
It comports well with Darwin's realization that a physiological and morphological traits are phylogenetically continuous. So too are mental and psychological ones, a point I have stressed since 1980 to counter ideological skepticism about animal consciousness among scientists. By the way, uh, I'm sure you'll be pleased to learn that um, this last summer, the scientific community had a consensus conference at Cambridge in Britain and came to the conclusion that animals are conscious. Um, hot news, right? Well, I mean, I have a 300 page book with Oxford University Press proving that animals feel pain, which is even silly. And yet, um, are anybody, anybody trained before about 1980 in veterinary medicine? How much did you guys learn about analgesia? Nothing. Nothing. In 1982, I wrote the uh, federal laws for lab animals, and I went before Congress, and uh, Henry Waxman asked me to prove that any law was necessary. And I said, well, the scientific community does not control pain that it inflicts on research animals. And Waxman said, they tell us they do, prove that they don't. I said, why is the burden on me? He said, because they give us a lot of money and you don't give us anything. I said, okay, fair enough. Good argument. Um, so I thought about it for a week, and then I went to my friend, who was a librarian at the Library of Congress. And April 1982, I did a literature search on analgesia for laboratory animals. How many papers did I find? That's right. Did you read my, my stuff? Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> she's right. Two papers. One of them said there ought to be papers. <laughs> so uh, I have to say that the scientific community was fitted at that point when they said that they they use analgesia all the time. Because had they used analgesia all the time, there would have been literature on laboratory animal analgesia. I went to Italy to talk about this stuff uh, two years ago, and I did a literature search. How many papers on analgesia did I find there? 12,000. So we went from two to 12,000 in 25 years. And I made the mistake of saying to the Italians, Accomplishing that by keeping out of hell, um, you know, presuming that God cares about animals. After all, it says in the New Testament, he sees that he's about to fall. So I got 50 emails from the time he was coming out of the one hell, <laughs> which was somewhat reassuring, <laughs> as if I had gotten one from God. <laughs> Kilo supports better with common sense. In fact, the Bill of Rights, as I said earlier, is about our obligations to humans, fundamental obligations we come across, basic rights, based on human telos as a, a rational being, a property owner being, uh, a being that doesn't wish to be tortured, etc. Uh, the notion of telos supports better with common sense than just talking about pleasure and pain, which has little problem attributing mental states to animals based on the telos fulfillment or violation. As I said earlier, fish got to swim, birds got to fly. And equally importantly, as concern for animals and animal welfare continues to evolve in society, it makes perfect sense to attribute happiness to animals satisfaction of most or all of an animal's needs arising from its telos. How many of you disagree with that point? Oh, good, good. Um, you would have gotten violent disagreement when I started in the setting among the group of better animals. Um, by the way, I'm in fairly good company with what scientists uh, often derisively called my anthropomorphism. Darwin himself believed that 
animals had the full range of mental state. Have any of you read Darwin's work on the intelligence of earthworms? It's in a book that didn't sell very well because it doesn't have a staff title. It's called The Formation of Vegetable Molds, which is not the sort of thing you throw up on the fire. But Darwin was very interested in the question of where the ability to problem solve and reason begins. And he noticed in, in the, the north of England that earthworms would, during the rainy season, would plug their burrows with leaves that were in long triangular shape, narrow and first, obviously, blocking the flow of rain. So he wondered whether it was, quote, instinct, innate behavior, hardwired behavior, or whether it was a rudimentary form of reasoning. So brilliantly, he sent to Australia for leaves from trees that don't grow in Britain, reasoning that if earthworms were hardwired, instinctively programmed to do this, they would only do it with the kind of leaves you find in, in Britain. And yet they did it with eucalyptus and other leaves, leading Darwin to conclude that earthworms, they don't get much longer than earthworms, have rudimentary reasoning ability. It is becoming increasingly clear to society that ethical obligations are not restricted to a set of admonitions designed to curtail pain, other noxious states, or even physical harm to them. Merely being able to affirm that one has not harmed an animal does not entail that one has behaved morally towards that animal, particularly regarding domestic animals. One could perhaps cogently argue that our only obligation towards wild animals is to leave them alone, and perhaps not to destroy their environment. That's not part of the topic here. We're talking about domestic animals. But I don't think any of you would argue in here that that is our only obligation to domestic animals, that is, those that we have made dependent on us, be they farm animals, zoo animals, research animals, or companion animals. In the case of all domestic animals, one can mount the argument that they are responsible not only for shielding them from harm, but also for assuring that we create a context in which they can flourish. We certainly act morally towards our horses when we provide them with food, water, shelter, and shade so that their lives are not significantly negative. But I think we're also morally required to make their lives positive, i.e. happy. How many of you have kept horses? Okay, good, there's a lot of them. Uh, I had horses for many years, and I've got 15 acres. In the winter, we keep them in a in a, about a two-acre paddock, which is pretty well denuded of vegetation. We feed hay. And then when spring comes, we turn them loose into the rest of the paddock. Okay? Are you familiar with that phenomenon? Any of you done that? Um, when you let them out for the first time in about March, <laughs> they kick, they buck, and they do that characteristic fart of happiness. <laughs> you know what I'm about? Kick, kick up the heels. <laughs> and I think that's pretty well indicative of great happiness. <laughs> now, this is a danger of the advancement of morphism of the climate from one species to another. Most of us do not have farts of happiness. <laughs> but we have the equivalent. No one, I would say, except perhaps the most extreme skeptic, can deny that equine behavior displayed under such conditions evidences clearly that these animals are experiencing what we have to call happiness, not, quote, happiness, end quote, which is what the scientific community used to say, uh, make fun of people like me. Anthropomorphic. By the way, um, are you familiar with the lab animal laws? Basically, they were about pain control. But what a lot of people forget, including the USDA, who's charged with enforcing these laws, 
It says pain and distress. And distress is meant to cover a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. The goddamn, you know, the goddamn USDA lawyers, however, have interpreted distress as meaning the pain, the, the, the uh, distress that emerges from painful situations and will not recognize distress as a category of separate from pain, which is a clear violation since I wrote the damn law, a clear violation of what we intended, what Congress intended, and hopefully they will be sued sooner rather than later. Um, the more that a person makes it his or her business to learn about an animal's telos and the individual differences that may be found among different animals of that kind, as when some dogs like the horse play with humans and others do not, the more we can be assured that we are not only not harming our animals, but providing them with opportunities for positive pleasure and happiness. Um, one of the first ways of enriching the situation for primates after the law passed was to give them Simon games. Are you familiar with Simon? It's a little computer that shows a series of colored lights, and then you have to replicate it on the keypad, and then it gets a little more complex and so forth. They gave that to uh, captive apes. And it was really interesting that some apes would play with that obsessively and fight to keep it. Others tossed it away. So there are individual differences that are very, very significant, and that's true in every species. In some, I've argued that the concept of telos provides a very sound basis for animal ethics. First, it avoids oversimplification of assimilating all the ways in which animals can be made to suffer to the single rubric of pain. Secondly, and very important, it activates ethical recollection rather than requiring assimilation of an unfamiliar ethical category. Third, it allows you to direct us not only toward the avoidance of negative experience for the animals we care for, but also enjoins us in the direction of maximizing positive experiences emerging from the animal's biological and psychological nature. In other words, acknowledging uh, telos as the basis for animal ethics is probably the most likely way to Sure that we respect animals' intrinsic value, the value that they have in themselves, not just their use value for us. And like I say, I'm sorry the prosecutor left because I want to make a point about cruelty. Kilos can also serve another purpose. Historically, until the late 20th century, the only societal ethic we had for animals was, in fact, embodied in the anti cruelty. And 35 years ago, I realized the total inadequacy of the anti-cruelty laws for providing a conceptual basis for a comprehensive societal consensus ethic for animal treatment. Most importantly, the anti-cruelty laws apply to only a tiny fraction of the suffering that animals experience at human hands. The anti-cruelty laws are intended to apply to deviant, deliberate, sadistic, purposeless, extraordinary infliction of pain and suffering on animals or not feeding and watering, and thereby to identify sadists and psychopaths who begin with animals and graduate to people. Our last 15 serial killers in the United States all began with animals. I also realized, as do my audiences, that the vast majority of animal suffering does not come from sadists and psychopaths, but rather from perfectly normal, decent, socially accepted uses of animals such as scientific research, studying the causes of a cure for disease, production of cheap and plentiful food, and testing substances in common use with toxicity. I thus predicted in the 70s that animal ethics would expand in the direction of legislated protection for animals used in such activities. And that was, in fact, what we did with the laboratory animal laws. Um, more recently, I've come to realize that the anti-cruelty laws are not only inadequate for covering the most animal suffering, they are grossly inadequate even for the purposes they were developed to accomplish. I was recently consulted on two cruelty cases 
that did not involve any physical harm to the animals, but in one case, psychological harm, and in the other, training the animal in a way that made it absolutely unadoptable. After a study of the way anti-cruelty laws are actually used in the legal system, I learned that it is virtually impossible to prosecute a person for cruelty to animals unless the act results in some obvious physical wound or damage. Did he talk about that? <coughs> That's the biggest hole in the cruelty laws. Even the most animal welfare oriented prosecutor I know, in fact, she was a lady who spearheaded, the spearheaded legislation making veterinarians mandatory reporters of suspected cruelty in the state of Colorado. She would not conceptually countenance cruelty that didn't result in physical damage. Okay? And in case you want an example of one of the cases I was involved in, these were some rednecks in uh, Nebraska who had a puppy bull mastiff and the feet her every morning and every time she'd come out of her house, they'd shoot her with paintballs. And so she became terrified. My friend, who's a kind of a, a saint, an animal science professor, heard about this, had grown up with, with pit bulls, I mean with mastiffs, bull mastiffs, and drove clean to Nebraska and bought the dog from those rednecks. Um, took him five years to train her not to be afraid of any male approach. She'd cringe, she'd hide, you know. Um, I would say, unequivocally, in my own mind, that's cruelty. And yet I've never met a prosecutor who would prosecute that. And what that shows you is how grossly inadequate the cruelty laws are, not only for animal suffering in general, but even for deliberate and sadistic purposes, activities. Kilos provides us not only with a conceptual basis for the new ethic governing animal treatment that is not cruelty, but in some way, as for example, uh, in the case of cell stores, um, impoverished environments, keeping a social animal in solitary, keeping a nocturnal animal with 24 7 daylight, etc. It provides a category for rationally expanding legal control of cruelty. In that we have shown that deliberate actions not causing physical pain to harm an animal is more than physical pain does. Thus, for example, statistically keeping a calf away from her mother at random intervals would create major psychological violations of both cow and calf nature, but not physical pain, similar to the painful case. Though recent social ethics has moved, as I said in another paper, beyond cruelty. That does not mean we can't expand and shouldn't expand the obsolete anti-cruelty ethic as well. Perhaps the most poignant example of the efficacy of the ethic I developed with regard to telos occurred in 1980 when finally I published the ethic in a book. I did a full day seminar on animal ethics for representatives from every Canadian federal ministry that dealt with animal issues, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Wildlife, Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans, etc., etc. In the course of the discussion with all these, of these um, federal ministers of Canada, they reason appropriately and constructively that the best way to make progress in legislation derived from animal ethics is to create a general bill of rights for all animals and some specific versions for different kinds of animals. It happens that in attendance at the seminar was a high official from the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans. Three years later, I received an anonymous copy of a memo from somebody at this ministry. The memo had been sent by the minister to the director of the Vancouver Aquarium, who had in turn requested permission to take two killer whales from Canadian waters for an exhibit at the aquarium. The minister responded that such permission would be granted only when the aquarium had demonstrated that the exhibit was designed to respect and accommodate the animal's kilos. Thank you very much for listening.
not possible. That's a very good question and well phrased. Thank you. Um, I've had people from the industry say to me, well, you obviously don't care about pigs. And I say, why is that? They say, well, if you didn't have a thyroid break, the pigs would all be dead. And you wouldn't have any pigs. I said, how long has this confinement business been around? 75 years at most. How long have we had pigs? 11,000. So it's wonderful that you guys were around for the first 10,900 years to make sure the pigs didn't die out. Well, of course, they weren't. Here's what happened, and I, I, I'm happy to give you a question because I got an answer. Um, the, you know what the Pig Improvement Company is? Pig Improvement Company is the source of 85, 90% of swine genetics around the country. And uh, they came to CSU to do a, a consult with me. And the, the president came, so it was a big deal, and the chief veterinary officer. And he said, do, does public revulsion to gestation crates extend to frowning crates? I said, not at the moment, but eventually it will. I said, why do you ask? He says, because we can restore the maternal instinct. In a univocal breeding program for productivity, making the assumption of confinement, we just bred out the maternal instinct because we didn't need it. We could get it back in five years. You see? There was just an article in uh, Pig Progress. Did you get that by any chance? Pig Progress is a uh, uh, online little magazine in which they said a result of a recent study is that pigs in confinement when compared in terms of immunological status to pigs outdoors with all the problems you raised, the immunological capacity of the outdoor pigs is much harder. And this is an interesting magazine. But we kind of could have guessed that. You know what I mean? When you, when you keep things in unnatural conditions, I lived in the natural conditions for the first 26 years of my life, New York City. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I had asthma, I had every kind of psychogenic disease you could think of until I moved to Colorado, when all of a sudden I could metaphorically and physically breathe. You see? Thanks very much for your question. Anybody else? Anybody's offended by my talk? I'll see you outside. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, obviously, the domestic dog cannot be allowed in the same sort of environment as the wild dog. Okay? But by the same token, you can create approximations. Traditional agriculture was essentially a truncated version of the natural environment of those animals. And this has been actually tested at the University of Edinburgh. They built a 15-acre pig park and took domestic pigs and observed their behavior for 15 years and found that it was virtually identical to that of the European wild boar. Temple Brandon, when she was at the University of Illinois, took a 50th generation land grabs pig, which if I'm not mistaken, Jan, was a pig that was designed for the kind of and uh, essentially turned it loose outdoors. It immediately went for a mud wallow, jumped in, wouldn't leave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I mean, while there is a point to your question, and a good one, I think those differences can be accommodated. I mean, we don't just throw up our hands and say, well, therefore we can keep them in cages. Okay? We can come a hell of a lot closer to accommodating what remains of their natures of the body. And in any case, and this is the important point, you know, people get mad at me, they get mad at the humane society. It's the, the only thing that Wayne Caselli does that's brilliant is he understands where the public's head is at. You see? It isn't Wayne Caselli who's banning uh, South Stalls and field uh, breaks and all that. It's the public that doesn't find them acceptable. That's how I was able to convince Smithfield in 08 to give up the South Stall. I spent a full day with the Smithfield executives and I told them, the South Stall is due, and if you don't believe me, check it yourself. So they spent six months doing focus groups and uh, surveys and all that, and they called me up. They promised they'd call me in a year. They called me in six months and they said, we don't need any more time. 75% of the public finds SAS schools unacceptable. So we're announcing that to SAS And that's why it's stupid for the industry to fight this right? Because once Smithfield renounced the SAS store with their 55 million SAS, what are you going to do? I mean, Maple Leaf in Canada gave it up the next week. What's the small producer going to do to say, by God, I raise them in stalls, you know, and show pictures of them? It's dead. Get over it. What you should be doing if you're in the swine industry is working to get some, some tax breaks on changing because it's not your fault that suddenly society finds it unacceptable. I think that would get massive amounts of support. You should not be doing stupid, idiotic things by saying, how do you know the sow wants to turn around? Okay? In my dreams, when I'm a good boy, I dream that I'm debating one of these guys, you know? And there's no rules. I don't have to be nice. I don't have to be polite, which is not my natural state. But maybe it'll happen someday. That it? Yes, sir. I think I can talk loud enough. Um, don't you think that these animal rights groups that you said are just in tune, like Wayne Caselli with where the public's head is? No, it's they only just Wayne. have people that know how to write and get you by the heartstrings and the purse strings, and that they're absolutely influencing public perception? Sure. And I'm not denying uh, that Caselli is extremely clever and has a lot of money and all those things. But the bottom line is, he isn't making people reject South Stalls. You show them a picture. And Temple has done this. Temple does it on the airplane. Whenever she sits next to anybody, she will take out photographs of South Stalls and ask the people sitting next to her, what do you think of that? And just as Smithfield found, 75% said it's hot. And I don't blame the industry for instituting South Stalls. It was an experiment that it was meant to provide cheap and plentiful food, and these are not bad people, you know. Um, the flats who speak for them are bad people. They're the ones whose ass I want to kick. It's not the producer. 
you know? But you've got to realize it's an experiment that failed. It's essentially an experiment that failed. Okay?